Good morning and welcome again at our online church service uh, at Rhythm Church. And today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day and we will speak about it just now. But I would like to invite you guys back to church. Yes, we are back into the building today and from now on we will have church services again 9.30. But the online church service will also go on. So something that COVID-19 I think has brought along is there will always be an online service and yes, there will also be church back into the building. So we are getting together at 14735 Bratton Lane in Welch Branch. It's on Facebook, it's on our website, so you can have a look and you can join our church services at 9.30. Uh, Sunday mornings. It will be great to meet you and to spend time with you and to know you and your family better. Like I've said today it's Father's Day and yes from my side thanks to all the fathers everything you do for your family I think for the schools the community the churches uh, the way you serve in so many places thank you thank you for all the fights the suffering uh, the support, the structure, the discipline, everything that's part of being a dad that you do. And I think, uh, I hope you've been treated well today. Um, and I hope there's a little bit of maybe gifts or presents and a nice lunch and whatever for you at Father's Day. May God bless you. So I want to talk to the dads a little bit more, but it's for women as well. But I want to talk about being a real praying man. And do we still have men that can really pray and pray change into this world and, and be prayer warriors and, and to be really men and women of God who can spend time in prayer and pray till there's change and miracles and things happening. When I worked on it, I, I, I wrote down on a, on a piece of paper, uh, being a praying man, and all of a sudden I'm thinking praying mantis. Uh, I will have a picture for you on, online uh, of a praying mantis. Because uh, that uh, insect is very well known and a uh, beautiful insect. But it's a scary insect with that fangs, legs of him making that praying hands. And when I looked at it and I read about it, it was quite interesting. And I will get back to the praying mantis. But the question... Are you a praying man? And how can I become one? And how can I serve God, church, family, my loved ones by being a man of prayer? What happened, how I got to the sermon was I was reading Acts uh, after Pentecost, of course, and then we did that Sunday, the perfect church, and I was just keep on going through Acts. And then we got to that uh, Acts 3.19 times of refreshing, amazing. Uh, I got a message from a lady out of Dallas just saying to me how she needed that. The times of refreshing, that pouring of the water over you of, of everything is new, everything is better and we've got through stuff and God is in control. Times of refreshing. So I just kept on reading. And around about here in Acts 12, all of a sudden something uh, struck me. Uh, something about all the great things and bad things, but all the big things that happened with the first church was while they were praying. I mean, every story had a verse in where someone, somebody, all the church was busy praying. And as they were praying, something happened. The correlation between God working and the church praying was amazing. It was, I mean... We know it. We say, yeah, God works in prayer and we've got scriptures saying that. But when I saw it and I saw the different kind of prayers that the men of God prayed, it was like, I want to do a study of this. And I did. I, I just began again at Acts 3, Acts 2, going through all the verses where it says, and they prayed or he prayed. And what happened? It was amazing to see in every chapter, God worked when the church Prayed. So the question will be, are you a praying man? Uh, are you getting the results you want? Are you seeing the life change that you desire? Um, are you happy 
with the way you pray and your relationship with Jesus Christ is growing and the difference you are bringing about in your family, the difference you're bringing about in your community because you are a praying man. So on Father's Day, let's work on being a praying man we can put that word in and uh, let's play with that word and let's go to Acts and let's go quickly through all those verses just showing you the different kind of prayers and the different kind of miracles and all the stories that happened while they were praying man test let's go and look it starts in Acts 2 of course and we've uh, we've looked at this verse it was Acts 2 verse 1 says the church were all together in one place praying and the next moment and suddenly there was that rushing of the wind and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, tongues of fire and the church started and 3,000 people got saved. Amazing, but it all started Acts 2 verse 1 when they were all together praying in the upper room. Acts 2 verse 42 it says, The church was devoted to the teachings of the apostles, the breaking of the bread and to prayer. They were devoted to prayer. They, they honored the prayer times, the prayer hours. They honored the times the, the apostles scheduled, say we're coming together, together for early morning prayers. We come together for afternoon prayers. We come together for late evening prayers. They were devoted to the times of prayer. And then one of the first big miracles that we see starts in Acts 3 verse 1 with these words. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 p.m. or the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. So they had an organized time of prayer. It, it wasn't just um, they felt led to pray because that's the way we do it these days. Hey, um, you don't want to force prayer. You don't want to make prayer legalistic. You don't, you don't want to feel that you need to pray and it's a command that you tick off and you do whenever the church says you need. No, we want to be free and we just have a relationship with Jesus. The first church, they had an hour of prayer. And Peter and John was used to going to the church or the temple at that time. So it was organized, it was routine, it was something like legalistic. But God worked and God met them there. Maybe you remember the story and in our daily devotion or daily coffee time, we will go through this story in detail. It was where the lame man was there begging and Peter told him, silver and gold I don't have for you, but what I do have is the name of Jesus. So get up and walk. You know, the only way, the only way, you get the power to say stuff like that is through prayer. <laughs> yes, if you spend your time making silver and gold, then you will be able to say to your family or members or co-workers or you will be able to say to a beggar or whatever, silver and gold I do have for you. Why? Because you've worked for silver and gold. That is where you put all your energy in. That is what you focus on. Now, nothing wrong. I mean, I work and I support my family and I want money to look after them and send them to college. And Nothing wrong with that. But if that is my main power, you know what's that power? It's temporary. I can only help them now. I can only help them in this life. I can't do anything for eternity. I can't save them. I can't connect them with Jesus Christ and give them the healing and the forgiveness of sin. So, so Peter has got this power for eternity. He says, silver and gold I don't have for you. But what I do have, I've got the power and the knowledge and the relationship with Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus, I command you, get up and walk. Why could Peter do that? He was a praying man. Yes, organized prayer, um, timely prayer, uh, repetition prayer, but he was a man of prayer and his prayers had power. So in, in Acts 3 we see this story, amazing story, and, and it led to uh, uh, more than 2,000 people getting saved again. If you follow the story, it was the start of the persecution because after this Peter and John were taking captives, but the, this guy jumping, praising God because of his healing and prayer, a lot of people come together again. So everything started 
and the organized time of prayer. And like I've said, maybe we don't like that. We don't like it when the pastor of the church say, let's get together every morning five o'clock and pray. Let's get together Wednesday nights at seven and let's pray. When there's a prayer meeting, we like, you know, I'm free. You know, God saved me and I've lived by grace and I live by mercy and, and I'll come to church on Sunday. There's power in prayer hours. There's power in prayer time. And when you go there every day, we will see it in the rest of the story. There's power in this prayer. Okay, chapter 4. What happened in chapter 4? So Peter and John got in jail um, and they testified before the Jewish leader and all of that. And long stories. But at the end of chapter 4, they've been released. And as they've been released, they've been sent back to their own people, the church. And as they got back to the church and they start telling the church what happened, as they heard these voice or as they heard this story, the whole church starting praying again. And then in, in, in Acts 4, at the end of Acts 4, we've got this amazing story of a second anointing or blessing or a second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When? When the church prayed. And we've got the story where, where they were all filled with boldness to go out and testify again. So um, I think when you follow the storyline, it's every time when they pray. I want to share with you just a few words. It says something like this in Acts 4 verse um, 29. It says, And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that you, your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your servant Jesus. Now listen to this. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. They were again all together at the church in a time of prayer. And pouring out their hearts to God, being threatened, scary environment, COVID-19, riots, losing jobs, scary environment, environment. But they prayed and God poured out the Spirit again on them. When? When they prayed together. Okay, let's carry on. In Acts 5, 5.12 you will see, And many healings and signs and wonders happened when Peter and the disciples and the apostles prayed over people. Acts 6 verse two, uh, 6, 6 um, they had to choose some new leaders, elders, deacons, doing work with the poor and giving out food. And as they were making the decisions, who will be in and out and all of that, it says, and they brought them together, the elders uh, or the apostles laid their hands on them, and they prayed for them. And then the conflict stopped and they start giving out the food. Again, after they prayed. In John, uh, Acts 7, we see the persecution really starting to take off. And in Acts 7, it's a sad story of Stephen being stoned to death uh, for his witness of Jesus Christ. But again, when they are busy stoning um, Stephen, He's on his knees praying. And, he, and the scripture says as he was praying, he could see heaven go open. And he sees the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father. It made the crowds mad because he was, you know, the, those words were God were one. And to see the Son of God next to him, they didn't understand it. But then he speak these words. He says, Father, forgive them. Don't add these sins to their plate of sins. He, he, he prays the same words as Jesus prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they've done. You could see this is people filled with prayer, even in tough times, even in times of death, even in times when you could ask, where's God? Why ain't he saving Stephen? Um, come to his resurrection or pull him out of there or send angels or whatever. Stephen is a man of prayer. He's a praying man and he could see heaven goes open. Some scripture says his face started to shine with glory. I mean, that's amazing. And all of a sudden the persecution starts. 
and the whole church is be, being pushed out of Jerusalem and is going to all the areas. Of course, while they were being pushed out, they testified. The first story, Acts 8, of that is they were being pushed to Samaria. Now, maybe you remember, Jesus told them, when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and the second and Samaria. Now, Samaria was that place the Jews didn't like. Remember when Jesus were there testifying to the Samarian woman and the rest of the disciples asked him, what are we doing here? Because they weren't best of friends, but all of a sudden, they were there because of the persecution. And as they testified, a lot of the Sumerian people got to uh, get saved in Jesus Christ. And then they asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, we haven't been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And they sent Peter to them. And in Acts 8, we could see these words again. Now when the apostles in, Jesus, uh, in Jerusalem heard that the Sumerians had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them and they, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit and prayer, the wonders, the miracles is going together with prayer. Uh, later in Acts 8, we get another story of Philip. He's busy praying and as he was praying, uh, a vision or was it an angel? An angel appeared to him. Uh, yes, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in Acts 8, 26 and says to him, go to that road. And as he got up and says, yes, Lord, I will go. He got to that road and there was that Ethiopian Enoch man working for the princess of, of uh, Ethiopia. And he discussed with him Isaiah, I think it was 53. And that man got off the coach and he got baptized right there. Everything because of Philip was praying. So maybe, maybe you're asking, why don't I see God working? Why don't we see miracles like that? Why, why don't we see angels and visions and we're getting to that? Why ain't I being led by the Holy Spirit and big works and powerful testimonies? Maybe we ain't praying men like that. Maybe we ain't praying like Philip or like Peter or the first church or like Stephen. So everything happened when they prayed. The story carries on. Acts 9. Acts 9 is well known for where Saul or Paul got saved. Riding on his donkey, big light hitting him. It's Jesus you're persecuting. He ends up in a street. I think it was called Straight Street in a guy named Judas's house. But... The story goes on when Ananias, a disciple, a normal disciple, not a, not, a, not a pastor, not an apostle. You know, we think only the pastors need to pray. Only the apostles need to pray. The big people need to pray. No, when a normal disciple Ananias prayed, the angel of the Lord or the Lord self spoke to him and said to him, Ananias, go to Straight Street and there you will find a guy named Saul. And he has been praying as you has been praying and he needs you to come and lay your hands on him so that he can receive his sight back. Paul was blind after the light. And then Ananias said, no, I've heard of this guy. He is Saul. He's persecuting the church. I'm afraid of him. And the Lord says, no, Ananias, I'm sending you. Go and lay your hands on Paul and he will receive his sight back. And Ananias is obedient. He gets up. He goes there. He lays his hands on Saul. And Saul changes to Paul. And he receives his sight back. And he's calling to be the guy who changes most of the ancient world with the gospel, going on the trips and mission trips and taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Amazing stuff happened. After Ananias prayed, after Saul prayed, this whole story. In fact, two-thirds of the New Testament has been written by this guy. And where did this start? By a normal disciple, Ananias, who was a praying man. Just a praying man. And he heard God's voice and God sent him in Acts 9 to go and pray for Paul. So let's carry on with the story in Acts 10 from verse 1. Uh, what happened there was the story of the Gentile 
Cornelius. I don't know if you know the story. I, I'm going to start and read it for you. It says, Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devoted man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many gifts to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Now listen to this. About 3 p.m. or the ninth hour, hour of prayer, do you remember in Acts 3? That was the same hour Peter went to the temple and healed the lame man. At 3 p.m. or the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, he clearly saw a vision of an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, now let, tell me, let me tell you the story. He tells him, go to this street in Joppa and you will, uh, you will see a guy there, his name is Peter. Invite him to come to your house and share the gospel with you. Now, Cornelius gets up. He asks his servants to go to that house where he will find a guy named Peter and invite him to, to his house. At that same time, in, in Acts 10 verse 9, we see Peter was also praying. And he was hungry and he went up to the roof and prayed on the top floor. And as he was praying... He also received the vision. And the vision was about that white sheet coming down and he see all these animals, reptiles, all the wrong animals on this sheet of paper, fish and all of this. And the voice of the Lord saying to him, you may kill them, slaughter them and eat them. And Peter says, never, 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 never. I will never eat something that is unclean. And God says to Peter, don't call something that is unclean. What, I, what I've made and what I've told you to eat. So it happens three times and Peter doesn't understand what it's all about. And then the angel and the vision of the Lord came to him and says, I, I, will, I will send people to you. And at that moment, the servants of Cornelius gets to, to, to Peter and takes him to Cornelius. And while he was busy teaching Cornelius and the heathen, the Gentile family, about Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And it's the first known Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to get saved. At this point of time, the church only consists of people, 5,000 plus of them, that had a Jewish background, that was part of the 12 tribes of Israel. So for the first time, a Gentile got saved. How? Because of prayer. Because they were both praying. Peter were praying Cornelius were praying, both were listening to God, listening to the Spirit, organized prayer, time of prayer, doing the right stuff, and God intervened, and there's a miracle. We could carry on in Acts 12. People were, uh, Peter got caught again and put into prison, and the scripture says, but as he was kept in prison, the church was earnestly praying to God for him, and an angel came, opened the prison doors. The next morning when the Jewish leader looked for Peter, he was away. He wasn't in prison anymore. He was back with his people. And, and we can just carry on. All the great stuff in the Bible, the first church, that happened, happened when they were praying men. As I studied it, I was thinking, what if they didn't pray? I mean, just imagine the Bible, not this thick, but this thick. <laughs> Why? Because we didn't have all these stories. Because we didn't have a Paul writing all of this. We didn't have Gentiles coming to Christ because Cornelius didn't pray and Peter didn't pray. Or we didn't have a Paul going on mission trips because Ananias didn't pray. Or we didn't have any um, kind of, 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 of story of the first church doing the miracles and everything. Stephen praying and having hope for the future and the life after this, seeing heaven. Just imagine, they didn't pray and we didn't have these stories. I mean, maybe that is why we don't have these stories these days. <laughs> or let me put it this way, as many stories, because we don't pray as much. We are not praying men like they used to be praying mantis. 
the reason I'm playing with this praying mantis, maybe you're thinking, what is he doing with this praying mantis? I want to tell you about the praying mantis. It's not one of the biggest uh, insects. And it's definitely not one of the most poisonous insects. I mean, the praying mantis, uh, kids play with them. I play with it. It's beautiful to see them walk and it's the legs like that and the body and blah, blah, blah. It's a beautiful insect. But as you know, it's one of the most dangerous insects in the insects world. In fact, I've got pictures where praying mantis is actually eating and killing a gecko. It's a dangerous insect. And just when I saw it, the danger of, that, uh, of the praying mantis is that praying legs of him. They are filled with thorny, uh, grab kind of needles. And when the praying mantis grabs hold of almost any insects, twice its size, it could eat it. I mean, we need to become more praying man praying mantis. Um, and just for Father's Day, I need to put this in there. We don't need to become totally like praying mantis because in the praying mantis world, uh, the female praying mantis eats the husband after mating. So, okay, no praying mantis the whole way, all right? Just stay safe <laughs> when we're talking about the praying mantis. But it's something about, are you dangerous? Do you have the power of prayer on your side? Um, does your family trust your prayers? Uh, when, when stuff happens, do they phone you and ask, pray for, please pray with us, because they know there is power in your prayer. They know you are dangerous to the enemy when you pray. Uh, Weekly, I talk to people back in South Africa and even now here in America, people who lose their jobs or bad things happening because of the COVID. And it's so nice. Every time I talk with them, they would ask me, please pray. Please pray. And, and I'm just thinking, why do they ask me to please pray? There's something in it. They know I'm a praying man. Man, tis. I like to pray. I've got my hours in prayer. I've got my routine prayer. I've got my prayer of repetition where I would say the same prayer over and over again and concentrating on the words and what God is saying. I, I like to listen in prayer. I like to see visions and hear stuff and angels speaking, Holy Spirit leading. I don't get stuff like they've got it here in Acts, but something about it, there's a praying man. And I want to be that praying man. So today on Father's Day, it's not just your job to provide for your family. It's not just your job to bring discipline and security and financial security. It's not just your job to put a vision of the future, where you would go and what's your plan, strategy. You know, we are supposed to be praying men. Men that can truly pray for our kids. I mean, in America, I've seen kids going haywire because dads are chasing the dream of uh, more money, bigger cars, bigger houses, financial dreams. They're chasing it. And the kids are living without Jesus. And the kids are confused with identity. They don't know where they're going and need to do. And I'm asking, can that dad pray with his boy, with his girl? Can he pray to be sorted out, to know what's God's will for your life. Do we have praying men? Maybe you're saying, Andre's prayer doesn't come easy to me. You're not alone. Um, I'm thinking of the disciples. One time when Jesus was praying, uh, when he returned to them, they asked him, please teach us how to pray. And that's such a beautiful question. If you can just ask that in your heart and you can just say, Holy Spirit, teach me how to pray. Or Jesus, help me, teach me how to pray. He will, I promise you, He will teach you. Just in these stories, I can show you a few things. There's something in repetition prayer. There's something in organized prayer. There's something in uh, um, intercession prayer where you pray for somebody else not just for yourself there's something in praying alone and there's something in praying together when last did you come together with two three other men and just say let's pray let's pray for your wife and your kids let's pray for my wife or my kids let's pray for your job let's pray for your company let's pray let's pray together 
this power in the press when the church came together. So it's not that hard, to be honest. <laughs> if we truly want to be teaching and taught how to pray, w the Holy Spirit will. And He will send men around us to help us how to pray. So actually we don't have an excuse. Maybe it's because we're going after the silver and gold and not to have the power. What I do have is the name of Jesus to give to you. We're more focused. We can help men budget. We can help men putting up some financial plan. We can help men about a lot of things in business world and strategies and sports and hobbies. But can we still help men pray? And we can. It's actually not that difficult. So when I go through these, I see something about the power of listening in prayer. I mean, Ananias heard, Peter heard, Cornelius saw they were open in prayer. In our daily coffee time, we talk about come away, open up, focus on the word, figure out what God is saying. All those words, both of all four of them are saying something about, do you still listen in prayer? Or is prayer just something... You know, God help me here, help me there, new job, better, more money, sort out the kids, make my wife love me again or whatever. You're just saying a bunch of stuff. You never open. You never figure out what is God saying to me? What's His plans to me? You never sit still long enough. You don't have organized prayer. I mean, I just think this way. If God knows you will pray every afternoon 6 o'clock, if God knows you will pray every morning 5 o'clock or whenever, when God knows He can make an appointment with you, <laughs> you know, maybe it's because we just pray whenever we feel like it. Then God is like, I don't know when you're going to pray, I don't know when to show up. But when Peter and Cornelius and the first church, when they prayed, they had an hour of prayer and they said, this is our time. And we're going to pray. And God knew they will be there. And the lame man knew Peter and whoever will be there at that gate. And Cornelius, when he prayed, God knew it. And when Peter prayed, God knew it. And they could send. And Ananias prayed, God knew. And he could send Ananias to Saul. There's something in having structure in your prayer life. To say, I'm going to pray every morning. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to pray every evening. I'm going to have a structured prayer life. And I'm going to listen in my prayer life. And I'm going to follow a book maybe, an immense book or whatever. But you need to have a plan and a structure. And you need to be listening. And you need to have a heart that say, Lord, teach me how to pray. Of course, the, one of the best prayers is the Lord's Prayer. Hey, Jesus' Prayer. When, when the disciples asked, please, Lord, show us how to pray, he showed them our Father that art, art in heaven. And maybe we can just read that again and just quiet our hearts and say, do I really know this prayer? And is this prayer really part of my life? If I struggle with praying, if, if you say to me, Andres, I can't pray, I just want to invite you, go to Matthew 6 verse 9 and just pray the Lord's Prayer over and over again. Once I've did it in South Africa. Back in South Africa, we were teaching about prayer and we did it to the whole congregation. And we said, go and do the Lord's Prayer every day, maybe three times, four times, five times. And I remember in my own life, I ended up saying the Lord's Prayer seven times in a row. And the first time it was concentrating to know it out of my head and just say it, Our Father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in, earth, uh, as in heaven, so it be on earth. And I was concentrating on the words. The second time, the words came easier. The third time, I was more into the prayer. By the fourth time, I was started crying because this prayer really took my heart. By the fifth time, I was like... Lord, you are providing for me. You are looking after me. You're forgiving my sins. You're protecting me again. I can't remember by the seventh time I was saying that prayer, the same repetition of the Lord's Prayer over and over again. It just changed me. It changed our congregation. It changed prayer back in South Africa. So maybe that's all you need to do. Just start praying the Lord's Prayer over and over again for a whole week, every morning at the same time, and let's see what happens. I can tell you what's going to happen. 
you are going to become a praying man. Out of that prayer, He will lead you into more words. He will take you into deeper stuff. He will take your heart to places. He will take, give you vision plans. He will give you a love for your neighbor and to people. And He will give you insight into stories. Just pray the Lord's Prayer for a week, the same time, every day, every morning, and repeat it every day, three, four, five times. Let, let's just do it together now. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer again. It says, Our Father who is in heaven. I mean, it's our Father. It's not my Father. It's our Father. When the church is together, it's everybody's. Black, white, all color, all people, all race, all people. Our Father who is in heaven. He's not on earth. He's not struck in these kingdoms, these fights, these battles, this normal stuff. Now He's in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your name will be holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Nothing wrong to pray for finances. Nothing wrong, uh, wrong to pray for silver and gold. But we must have Jesus more than we have silver and gold. But you can pray, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I think there's a lot of work to be done to live guilt-free, to live in His mercy, to live in His grace, and to extend it to our enemies. As we have forgiven other people who has done stuff against us, and help us to live li like that. And then, and do not lead us into temptation, but do deliver us from evil. I mean, that is so powerful and so much has been said about that verse, about God is not leading at us into temptation. It's the devil who's doing it, but God can protect us and that's the way we grow. But you can pray that over and over again. Lead us not into t t temptation, but deliver us. Deliver my children, deliver my family, deliver the country, de deliver my, f my company from evil. Evil is everywhere, busy destroying Hating people against one another, raging against one another, uh, creating the fear, creating evil and bad things all the time. We need to pray. Deliver us from evil over and over again. And then the last part, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I mean, those last words for me personally, that is so powerful to just to remind myself. For God, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Nowhere else. Nobody has power over my life. Nobody has power over my future. Nobody has power over my children's future. God has the power, the glory and the kingdom. All, all is, is His. He's got the strength and the power to sort out everything. And just to end that prayer over and over again, three times, four times, five times, maybe in the morning, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. And you are in control. And I give you that control. So maybe that's the way for you to start to pray and become a praying man, a dangerous man in a time like this who wakes up every morning and spend time with God and sort out stuff with God and maybe in the afternoon a short minute or two of prayer and maybe in the evening again just closing the day with God I'm becoming a praying man I want to I want to end this sermon today with the story of Job um, it's a story that really uh, I want to actually just preach about Job for Father's Day and then this whole thing in Acts happened when I saw the praying man and all of that. But I want to end with the story of Job. Why? Because he was an amazing businessman. If you go to uh, Job 1, you would see he was a rich man. He was a great businessman. He was an amazing father. He sacrificed for his kids and, and he had his kids all around him and they loved to spend time with him and he loved to spend time with them and they loved to spend time together. So it was a great family. He was successful. He had uh, his wife and his kids. He had a great name uh, all around him. All the people respected him. So J Job, he was an amazing guy. On Father's Day, 
he had great Father's Day gifts. Everybody liked him. It was great. It was beautiful. But then one day the devil, the evil one, came and said, you know, Job is enjoying this just because God is so good to him. I promise you, if we start taking away stuff from Job, he will start fighting with God, cursing God, and he will turn against God. So Job is not that a great guy. It's only because God is so good to him that he is so great. And God said, I promise you, Job is a great guy. He loves me. He truly loves me. And then God said, okay, devil, you can start taking away stuff from Job. And, and that's a big question. What will happen with your faith when God allows stuff to get taken away from you? When you are being tested, tested in your family, tested in finance, tested in your health, in your body. What will happen when God's starting moving the life a bit around in your life? So Job went through all of this. And then what happened from about uh, chapter 5 all the way to chapter 38, his friends started giving him advice, but wrong advice. He had them the greatest of friends. They, they said, you did wrong and it's sin and God doesn't love you and curse him and leave him and you did wrong and, and, and a lot of bad stuff. He, even his wife said, you were stern against God. And then Job just said one thing. He, he kept on praying. I want to speak to God. I'm a praying man and only God can give me an answer for why am I going through this and only God is the one that truly knows me he was a praying man and he stayed a praying man right through the book and he stayed faithful and he waited for God to answer at the end around about chapter 38 39 uh, 40 41 God started to answer Job but not like he wanted to <laughs> God didn't come and say, listen, Job, sorry for what had happened. And I'm, oh, God, you're all right. And we are right. And I love you. No, no. God came to him and said, Job, you're this big and I'm this big. And you will never understand stuff. And you will never understand pain. And you will never understand suffering. Your mind can't comprehend how big the universe and the kingdom of God and everything God is doing. So God gave him an answer. But it was too powerful, actually, for Job. He just said, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't understand. And then at the end... In Job 42, verse 10, it says these words, The Lord restored the fortune of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Verse 12 says the following, The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And I want to end with this. If you want to end well, if you want your whole life to count, I mean, we work hard when we're young, we build up stuff in our 30s and 40s, and we're hopeful that in our 50s, 60s, we can retire and the kids will love us. And we, we all work towards our 60s, 70s to have a great life. Here's the secret. If you want to end well, you need to be a praying man. You need to have the ability to hear the voice of God. You need to, because in life stuff will happen. You will get into trouble. Stuff, there will be suffering. The devil will come and steal from you. Life doesn't work out like you've planned it, got all your secure funds, and the wife will love you till the end, and the kids will be with you, and your body will be healthy. Life happens. But the only way you can get to a better ending, better than a beginning, if you want to end well, you need to be a praying man. In the story, it says uh, God restored all his fortune when he prayed for his friends. Now, you say, oh, that's easy. I like my friends. I, would, I wouldn't mind praying with great men all around me, praying together. God loves us and bless us. No, you must remember his friends were bad friends. <laughs> If you go into the story, just before this verse, it says God wanted to kill his friends. Even God wanted to kill them. Why? Because they, they accused Job. They, they judged him. They gave him wrong, wrong advice about God. They sp spoke wrongly about the Bible, about God and the truth. And, and they were bad, bad friends. And actually... Job didn't want to be friends with them anymore because 
you know, that kind of friends. Who wants to be friends with people who judge you and say wrong things about you and spread rumors about you and saying it's your own fault and your mistake and you did this and you did that. So at that point of time, Job didn't want to pray for them. But he had the ability to hear God's voice. And God says, Job, I will restore. I will let you end well. I will give you a great blessing till the end of your days. I will give you plenty, double what you had. I will restore everything if you can pray for those bad friends. It's like the Lord's Prayer. Lord, forgive us our debt as we forgave those who debt against us. You know, to have the ability to truly be a praying man, hearing and listening God's voice. So I want to end this by asking you, by calling you on this Father's Day to become a praying man. And just for the fun of it, a praying mantis. To become dangerous in your prayers. To build a second half of life that's better than a first half. To go from great to greater. To go forward, to, to serve your, your community, serve your church, serve uh, your family, to even have more, to change even more lives. Why? Because we are praying men. And we can go through life, sufferings, hardship, trouble, and we will not just survive them, we will thrive in them. Why? Because we are praying men. I want to pray this for you and I want to pray this blessing over you that this week you will start a prayer life like never before and maybe routine prayer life and repetition prayer life and listening open prayer life and truly going through prayer the way Jesus called us. Maybe you start with the, uh, praying the, the Jesus prayer over and over again. So I want to pray with you today a blessing over you on Father's Day. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the fathers out there, all the men out there, dads out there, giving themselves, sacrificing, working for their families, trying to be the right guy, the right man for this time. And now I want to pray for them, for becoming truly praying men. Men who spend time, men who close the door and open the Bible and truly pray. Pray until there's change. Pray until the kids get healed. Pray until the kids find Jesus and follow Jesus. Pray until a work comes through. Pray until a relationship is restored. Pray, pray, pray. Just like Job prayed. And you restored everything in his life. Lord, we want to end well. We want to end with a testimony of the grace and the goodness of God. We want to end stronger than what we've started. And the only way possible is if we are praying men. Help us with this. Meet us in the mornings, the afternoon, the evening. Meet us in prayer. Speak to us. Guide us. Lead us. And just pour your grace and mercy out upon us so that we can be praying men. And we can have stories like Cornelius and Ananias and Stephanus and Peter, and we can carry on. We can have stories of life-changing things happening around us because we are praying men. Bless all the men today and bless them in becoming praying men. In Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, we are back in the building. I would like to invite you, come and join us and help us build God's kingdom with Rhythm Church. All the best. See you again.